Hello. Welcome to this first ever episode of the SJDK podcast. My name is Well Kasim and I'm the pastoral assistant at St. John the Divine in Kennington. This is the first in our Advent series entitled Black Lives Matter at SJDK. This Advent, we hear the voices of black members of our congregation and consider what an anti-racist church would look like. We have some fascinating conversations coming up with women of the Windrush generation, those who are becoming the Black Lives Matter generation, and our own church leaders. But first, in this episode, I was very glad to be joined by John Denny, well-loved member of the congregation and former local councillor. We had a hopeful and determined conversation, and I hope you're inspired and enjoy. For the benefit of um, uh, anyone who might listen to this, would you just first maybe introduce yourself? Uh, say say who you are. But well, how do I, <laughs> my, my my name is John Denny. I'm a, a, one of the, the people who attend St John the Divine uh, Parish Church. As a, yeah. that's great. It's as simple as that. Nothing yeah. great. Nothing big about it. It's, it's me. So. Um, I wanted to start then with uh, just talking about your experiences. Uh, and I thought maybe it would be interesting for people to first hear about what your earliest memories of St. John the Divine are. I'll start by saying that um, I was more drawn to the primary schools because I had a couple of people who were uh, actually having children attending the school and they weren't quite sure of what uh, what the expectations would be and what was happening to children at the school and where it actually where it actually you know was taken was taken then so I, I think that that's what I would start by then that's where I begun and that's where the connection genuinely cemented itself to school uh, church and then from church back to school so it's the sort of thing that uh that's how the relationships actually grew yeah. okay um i wonder if you could maybe say a little bit about the context in britain or actually maybe more locally in london or this particular area of south london uh, at that time what in the 1980s and i guess in particular to race what was the um yeah what was happening we were aware of the fact that I think the, the issues we, we, we had problems with education that was that was, was ex- extremely poor in Lambeth we we found that um, there was a, a, a sort of a, a ceiling in terms of edu- uh, employment which no one rose above that and and the, the, the overall issue was how can we can we do better than this? What is happening? Why are we at this level? Why are our children not performing adequately? Why are our children not getting into the type of employment which they deserve to be in, and so forth and so on? And I think that was where that's the reason why we actually got as a small group and started to to push these issues forward. Okay, and, and was that uh, was that push that you made successful? Did um, was there change at that time in uh, in the eighties? Well, I don't think that there was an. It wasn't an overnight change. Obviously, we it was uh, working on working on the on the issues, putting forward our argument, getting other people involved, uniting, so to speak, and and gradually this made some impact on on the outlook on what came out of the out of Lambeth as such. The the politicians took some note of what we were doing and uh things started to change, yes. Some changes were made. Yeah. And when you when you look at the same sort of uh uh institutions, I guess today, do you 
do you think there's been even more kind of progress down that road or what's your es- kind of uh, estimation of what it what those challenges look like today well i think that <laughs> the, the, the problems which we encounter today i mean it is on a wider scale and I, and i would say that um it was a a response by uh, by by david lamy uh, who said that uh, uh, the absolute intention should be about and and to prioritize action rather than gestures and commissions etc and i feel that um what he was talking about is that although there are, there, there have been changes but uh, statistically, we are still stuck, and and um, uh, in 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 in, in the, the, a degree of racism, which is very very difficult to, to overcome. Um, I mean, then we talked about education in um, we talked about education in back in the in, in the eighties and probably in the nineties, but today we are still finding that uh, the the, stati- the statistics that uh, I, I, I have in mind would be how the number of people that are stopped and searched, the, 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 the actual, the background of those people um, who are, the Bami Britons are about, about twice as likely to be, to, to die from COVID-19, mm-hmm. that uh, white pupils are, are more than three times likely to achieve higher grades than Afro-Caribbeans. Um, we still say, look, that um, the FT100 companies still do not have a, 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 a known white board member and, and, you know, and so forth and so on. And I think that although we, we over, some of the issues that we face then been overcome, but again, there's just a, another raft of issues that, uh, that uh, we are confronted with. So it's difficult to say how whether things have actually changed, whether things have got better or worse. And I think that is that is something that well, we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is. It, I think it's uh, it is often difficult when we talk about uh, the progress that we've made. When sometimes it looks actually more like things might have gone backward, and actually mm-hmm. ra- racism seems to maybe uh, be a shape-shifting kind of thing. Uh, it's yeah. not always the same uh, same challenges, but there, there's a baseline yeah, yeah. problem. But uh, again, again, I think that this is, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 I don't know because the same challenges coming from a different direction, something like that. Right. So it, same <laughs> challenges sort of cover that. It, it, it has changed, but there's still serious obstacles which are institutionalized, and it's difficult to get them out of the get them out of the system. Mm. Great. Uh, uh, I just maybe want to use. You mentioned the statistics about stop and search, um, and actually, I think in October of this year, we uh, we learned once again because this isn't a new um, a new statistic or new information. But figures in England and Wales were showing that black people are actually nine times more likely to face stop and search than white people. But that's uh, so. That's definitely an example of the continuing uh, problem. I just wonder if you could maybe tell me a bit more about uh, the history of yeah. stop and search, but particularly in this area that uh, that is local to St John the Divine. What was stop and search? Because I know that, well, that in, particular in terms of uh, when it. I mean, I remembered um, it that the uh, the frightening racism which we experienced in, in Lambeth because a Brixton Police Station was noted and Brixton Police were noted for their brutal racism, which, I mean, I don't know, I can't say like nationally where this started, but I know in Brixton, it was just the norm, the norm to be stopped mm. and searched and, 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 and to be stopped. I mean, I, I, I experienced two years ago, about half past ten in the morning, being stopped in my old banger on the Brixton Road. And, 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 and my conclusion, as I said to the person who stopped me, was that what you saw in this old car was a black face. That's the only reason why you stopped me. You're not stopping an 80-year-old man. For what? At half past ten. Not for driving and drinking and driving. Not for 
taking weed around why would you, was I stopped. And I think that um, it was a culture of stop black people and search, which is still ongoing. Um, so it's, it, again, that's an institutionalized approach to us as black people. Yep. So when, it, when will it stop? How do we overcome it? I don't know. I'm not quite sure how many people were stopped <laughs> since the lockdown. Lord. But uh, yes, yeah. it is. It is. We, 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 are, we are more likely to be stopped than anyone else. And that's a fact. And this has been part of Lambeth. Nothing, nothing different. Nothing changed about that. Yeah. I was quite interested to see, actually, when I was coming into the parish during the tail end of the first lockdown um, to come in for open church, uh, just how many times I did see stop and searches happening in our local community uh, and with a, a lot of regularity. In fact, in some weeks, it was almost every day that I was walking home that I, I would see a stop and search happening. So it's definitely something that's continued. So you picked up on the institutional quality of racism there um and you gave that as part of the uh part of the reason that it's so enduring yeah um, what well, i my feel is that uh, within society within the structure of society there is an inherent feel there is a bias there is a fear and I, and I think these are some of the things which, which tend to institute within society. It's fear, it's, it's, it's bias, it's, it's a degree of uncertainty, it's a degree of distrustfulness. I mean, it's all group of feelings and emotions which go into it. Um, and it's and 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 that's the way we see uh, institutional racism. I, I don't think that quite often it is not about people deliberately setting out because oh John because John is black he's I'm going to be racist against him. The question is deep within us, and it's something we we both sides have to begin to understand is um, how to treat me, look beyond my race, look beyond my color, and see me as a human being, as a person. I think that's 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 how I see the, the escape, the way out of institutional racism, not to see the person, the color or origin, but as a human being. Yeah. And I think this is how we look at, and I would look at um, institutional racism, but it is d deep within the person, us. If we can overcome that and see people as human beings. Yeah, I think that's so important. Yeah, that's so important to say because in and so often we think of racism in a very naive way about uh, having offended somebody, offending somebody of a different race or a, a different ethnic group or whatever it is. And actually, if that was the case, it, it seems like it would be a lot easier. But what you're describing, it, it would be a lot easier to get rid of. But what you're describing is actually a lot scarier. That it's. Yeah. Uh, it's something that's actually much deeper in us and deeper in the yes. institutions around us. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I haven't, uh, I've not, I haven't actually read the book yet, but I've got, I've looked at it, a book called Uncomfortable Conversation with a Black Man. It's, it's written by a, a man called Emmanuel Acho, an American. And it's about, these are what we've got to do. We've got to genuinely have these conversations. It's going to be tough because we're deep. We're going to be going deep into people's psyche, into people's comfort zones, and saying, "Well, yes, you're more comfortable uh, with someone of your colour, or your class, or whatever." But you've got to begin to look beyond that, see outside of that, see other people, other groups. And let's talk. Let us be open and honest, and uh, begin that process. Because I think that is after COVID has to happen around our church, amongst us. Hmm. We've got to look at what has happened, look at the past, and how can we take something new, something different? 
forward. And I think it, this is this this is how we will begin to deal with racism. Mm. I th- that, thank That's, you. So, uh, you've put it so well there, and I think the way that you're describing it is actually very. Uh, it has a lot of resonances with the Christian message and what we're called to do as Christians and uh, and disciples in God's kingdom. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm interested to talk maybe a bit more about the church then. And I, I don't necessarily mean just St. John the Divine, but um, feel free to talk about St. John the Divine. Um, but what are your earliest experiences of, of the church? Oh, my earliest experiences of the church was about as a barefooted child mm-hmm. being taken into uh, St. Peter's Parish Church in Barbados. And that's, it could be six, I could have been five or six. And that was my, uh, that was my, experience yeah did you find that a did you find that a welcoming place it was it was because we we were taught we were taught to know our places you know at that time we were we were not um we were not um aware we weren't terribly aware of what it was that the type of, of racism that uh, was being uh, practiced at that time we didn't so that um it wasn't unusual to go into a church and being unable to sit in the first two or three uh, seats in front of the altar because they were uh, they were uh, not allowed you you had to pay to sit there and and or families were not in a position to pay to find that money to pay to sit near the altar so that in retrospect was my first my understanding later in life of of racism okay could you say a bit more why did people have to pay to sit uh, closer to the altar what was happening there well that was uh, i think it it was to segregate i mean you 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 didn't you weren't buying a seat in the middle of the church because then you were no segregation but if you sat first and if you saw the altar as the the, the, the font of Christianity or whatever, whatever, then you wanted to get as near as possible to that and you paid for that privilege. And what we were, what we saw, or what I saw in retrospect was that um, it was those people who had the, that, uh, you know, the money in which to do it. Yeah. And they, that's, that, that's my first encounter. In retrospect, looking back, that's my first encounter of racism time. within the Anglican Church at the time. Mm. Um, Here, it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about uh, paying to sit up front here, and and there are people who would say that they experienced being told, well, you just got to wait until we finish serving um, at the altar, and then you come up, you can't, you you were asked, you, you know, you can come along now, come up late in the day so it's it has been i mean there is no question about it as an institution the anglican church has been racist um it still is racist uh it's in, as an institution the question is how, how how best we can manage to bring justice and equality into the world. and i know that attempts are being made yes but uh, it it's still largely there yeah. Can I ask, did you, um, did you see yourself and your community, black people, um, both in Barbados and here in England, um, reflected in the people who were leading your services, the clergy in the Anglican Church? Um, well, when I, when I, <laughs> we first, I mean, when we had a first black bishop in in uh, in in Bar- uh, black bishop in barbados um was i was in this country that's so it's just yesterday that that part of the world we started to to genuinely uh, forge ahead in terms of making the, the church a nicer place to be to be part of here um 
the system has tried and is trying. It's not. It hasn't got very far. Right? We may have the individual. We may have the individual person who has made it up the ladder, but the overall approach uh, to dealing with systemic uh, racism, uh, putting in place things that uh, really matter, it hasn't happened. It's not happening in the church. And I'm not talking about a particular building. I'm not talking about uh, uh, St. John the Divine Parish Church on, on Vassar Road. I'm talking about the church It's in, as an institution, the church as, as, as a leader, the church is having the possibility of doing things that it, 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 it hasn't been done. It's really sad to kind of acknowledge that, isn't it? That the the church has its failings, and I, oh yes, it does. In in particular, in terms of a link between uh, schools in our area, or particularly in schools linked to churches more generally, um, it, do you think there's more to be done in encouraging leadership and encouraging people? Uh, who might have a vocation in the church from a, a younger age? Spot, spot on. Spot on. My position is this. If you can find from age eight the potential footballer who goes through an academy until age 11 and then from there on to whatever why can't we within our schools see the potential of those who you know who, who probably want to find a career as as a leader or something like that mm. you know this is very, very, I think it's very important, and I think it's a lost, it's genuinely a lost issue. Mm. It's a lost issue. Someone has to pick that up, so we can find people within that church. We could find leaders from within the church, whom we've identified at age eight or seven, or whatever the case may be. Right. I, th- I think that analogy that you make between finding a young footballer uh, and encouraging and nurturing yeah. their gifts is really interesting. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. a good question why we're not... We should, over the years, been literally recruiting, looking at... I, I, I recall um, about some years ago with uh, when Dennis Bradshaw was... was uh, priest at St. John, as we said, myself and a couple of people said, Dennis, how many of our young people are going on to university? Why don't we do something about it? Why don't we say at each year, those people from within the community, within the church who are uh, at uni, why don't we say to them, you know, stand and tell us about where you're going, what you're doing, and so forth and so on. Mm. And that opened up for those who were coming on, that opened up mm. an opportunity to see that there are people in, the, in here who have succeeded. Mm. That, and for about three, five years or so, there were every year, X amount of children who had come through St. John Divine Par- uh, Church and who had been through the schools, etc., etc., they said, yes, I, I, you know, and it was very, it was a proud moment, a proud moment for the, the young people, a proud moment for the parents of those young people, a proud moment for the church mm-hmm. that here you are. This is an outcome, a positive outcome. I think that that example that you give of um, asking people to come up and share uh, what they're going on to achieve, um, it's, it, it shows that the church really cares about the gifts that people have. Uh, yes. And it's, it's wrapped up in, the, in, in everything that people do with their lives. Uh, that sounds like a beautiful thing that was happening. Yes. 
it, 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 it can. I mean, this, this is the, for me, this is how we are, and people, but I think the entire congregation welcome this idea. It's kind of brought people a little bit closer together. So that in going forward, there are areas and issues which we should look at carefully, where we can carry the majority of our, con- our congregation in something very positive. And there are positive aspects that uh, are there. Yeah. I wonder, do do you think that the church, and I and again, I don't necessarily mean St. John the Divine, um, but do you think the church has played a positive role in anti-racism, the, in the history of anti-racism, and e- even if it's a small thing? Yes. Mm. And, and, and there is no question in my mind, there is no doubt in my mind that I am, I am aware of, of this year, of last year, uh, where the church played a very, very important role in helping to tackle racism. And they were there. There's no question about it. And it would be wrong of me to say that the church has been just uh, um, uh, colluded with racists, etc. No, the church has played. The church has played a substantial part in some of the successes which we have today. Mm. That's, that's a fact. I, I wouldn't like to elaborate because in, in, in elaborating, we probably have to say, well, you know, such and such said such and such and brought such and such to, to bear and so forth and so on. But the church has been very much behind the success of Vinrush and bringing Vinrush to a, a, to a head. And it has. I am well aware of that. Um, it was not only the politicians, but the church was played a substantial role in that. So, yes, it is there. And it, it can, it can play a, a role. It can, it's so close. I mean, the church is so close to people. To the people who really matter. The church has schools. Yeah. And that's the people who genuinely matter today. And that that positive experience of where the church has played a, a important role in anti-racism, uh, it's to be celebrated, but it also perhaps makes it even more painful when the church isn't doing what it can to the to the fullest. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think that that is a, that is the real disappointment. Um, you you you. The, the state cannot bring the church down, put it that way. Hmm. The church can be a bastion of equality, of, of anti-racism, you name it. It can be, because it can't be picked out and say, we will bring you down. We will work against the foundation of a movement and eventually bring, no. Hmm. No. I wonder then if you could tell us a bit about, um, and this can be outside of the church in wider society, what campaigns against racism do you think have been most influential in your lifetime? What have you seen as a real success? I think that when we look at the the various... um, laws uh, which have been enacted. I mean, some of those laws, some uh, legislation has been successful. I mean, we, we, we've looked at the, the fact that uh, abuse, abusive, being uh, abusing people of a different color or something like that is against the law. It can be used by these people, by the authorities. So that we managed to suppress, we managed to, to, to bring into uh, into play uh, laws which has dampened uh, some of the more vulgar uh, and, 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 and nastier aspects of, of racism. Yeah. We know that the local authorities have taken action against the, 
the kind of uh, the kind of people whom you would normally meet on a, a local housing estate and so forth and so on. So um, there are positive parts of it, uh, no question about it. But and that has been done by. Um, by the government, by local authorities, mm-hmm. b- by groups who have fought and fought and fought and fought for um, equality and for justice and so forth and so forth, uh, still a long way to go. But at least um, it has been seen and, and and it's accepted by the powers that be that there will always be those people who are not happy with what is going on and they'll be fighting to change that. Mm. Do you think those legal rights um, that have been won uh, and the, uh, I guess, particularly enshrining in law um, uh, anti-hate crime legislation, uh, do you think there's more work to be done along that road? um, uh, Yes. Yeah? Yes. No question about it. No question about it. Um, because when you look at, <laughs> if you pass through, you 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 stroll through London between age, between uh, on any given day, uh, a normal average day, not on the lockdown, and you, you look at the, the the children who are in the schools in Lambeth. You look, you go through Croydon and you see similar, and you you go through Southwark and so forth and so on. So you're looking at a change in demographic. And the system has to put in place, has to respect that uh, we have to care for this demographic. Whether it's on a national scale or whether it starts in the cities, I don't know. But, uh, and, and I think this is where, again, leadership comes into it. Who is going to genuinely lead this sort of uh, movement? It, it, it's, it's not going to be led by uh, political parties uh, because, you know, political parties, they have their own interests, their, 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 their people to support, et cetera, et cetera. But outside of that, this is a democratic, which within 10, 15 years, if it's not properly handled, what is going to happen? Mm-hmm. Where are we going? Where are you have a look at St. John the Divine uh, Primary. Have a look at uh, any any school around in this area. And again, it comes back to the church because the church should have and must have influence in dealing and looking at this within the next ten to fifteen years. The child today at 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 uh, who enters the primary school at at age four, whatever the case may be, in ten years' time, that child is fourteen. You know, I mean, 15 years, that's, that's, that's a 19-year-old. So what are we planning? What are we doing? How are we going to get these loads of children in there? How, where, where is the, the lead? Mm-hmm. And I find it, you know, it's not... I, I think that this is a, 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 something that we haven't looked at. The lead isn't coming from the politicians because the politicians are not looking at a four-year-old uh, and, and thinking, well, you know, in, four year, in, in 14 years' time, this child is going to vote this side or that side, or et cetera. Can we pick out some things that you think are the most uh, pressing or where the most energy is needed? Where should anti-racists be putting their focus at the moment? There's something we can learn from the Black Lives Movement. It's, it's not political. It was just people felt enough is enough. I've, I'm tired of this. Let us move forward. Let us try to change this, that, and the other. We, not long yes, we know that there are a variety of areas where we can, we can begin to support children. I, I let me say this. I felt that uh, there was a the, the, said, uh, there was a, the children from our school, the, the secondary school, across on Tuesdays mm-hmm. to have uh, fish and chips and <laughs> chicken and chips and so forth and so on. And they, that to me was the beginning of something. They came, they grouped, they looked at participating in the things they wanted to do, not what we felt they should be doing. And I think this is, has to be the thing, not what the system believes the child or the young person should do, but to find from the young person what they, what would be their interest, where do they see themselves in the next couple of years, etc. And this comes back to finding out 
from our schools what the likely outcome for of these youngsters. Now, it, it, it would be wrong to say, oh, well, we're going to have them into tennis, we're going to have them into football, we're going to have them into uh, song systems and music and all of that. I think it's a very important. We find out from them. So the priority one has to be back to basic, back to, back to actually being in touch with these young people mm. and being in touch not in a school setting because you've got to go to school from age 11 to age 16. Boom. But how can we outside of that structure, how can we talk to these people, to these youngsters and find out from them what, would, what do you think you would be interested in? What do you think you would want to do? What, what is your parent thinking about such and such and such and such? I think that that has to be, you've got to get back to that. It's, you know, I, I, I don't know whether it can happen again, I, I, but I think that's the start. We can, we must find out from the people who matter what they are really after. Yeah. I mean, we, we see this in Jesus's own ministry, don't we? The, he, people try to keep the young, the young people away from him, the children away from yeah. him. And he says, let yeah. the little children come to me. Do not stop. Yes. Forbid them not. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. We don't do that today. Right. I mean, all right, perhaps you could blame society because society has molded, has built structures which says, you know, it's a family of two, a family of one, and therefore you have no, that is it. But, um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think the schools have an immense chance of genuinely real support, real support. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> uh, if we, uh, I guess we're coming to an end now. I just want, uh, would you just give uh, some words of encouragement to people who um, feel that they have the energy to be leaders in anti-racism uh, and whether they, uh, wh whoever they are, whatever age they are, whatever race they might see themselves as, who have a feeling that they might be able to lead on this. Would you give them some yeah. words of encouragement? Yeah, well, I think... One of the things I would I would say is this, that I don't I wouldn't like young people to say, well, I am an I am an anti-racist and I'm going to to lead against the structure of racism, blah blah blah. I would like to say to you people, you are young people, you are a human being, irrespective of which race you're from. There are things we say are right, and there are things we say are wrong. Although it might not necessarily be as as simple as that, but Take on board and the guidance of those who can help you and try to make this a better place. Back to the Black Lives Matter. It's not about, it's about, let us move away from the, the wrong that has been done. Let us, let us start looking at and for those people who can help us in going forward and going forward, maybe in a Christian way. I'm not saying I wouldn't, but taking processes forward, doing things which helps my brother, my sister, which helps my community. Let us, like Bob Marley, let us get together and feel all right, dance and sing to the Lord. Okay. and feel all right let us feel that there's something positive i can, as a person as a young person there's something positive i can add to the life of others i may have to recruit other people to help me but let, that's where we want to go this is what i believe is so important so very very important there's a tremendous amount to live for there's a tremendous amount of good to be done in this world and I think we've got to say to, to these young people, you can be part of it. Even if you don't want to lead it, you can be part of that movement. And the movement is about doing good things to help others who mightn't be as fortunate as I. I think that's, that, that would be my word. Amazing. To young people. And we, it's there. And young people will do it. They'll, not everyone, but the potential is there. And there's some good things still being done in our church, 
but we need to have a, a fresh look, a new beginning. I hope it comes after COVID. Amazing. John, thank I'm you added. so much. Uh, it's been great to listen to you and to talk with you. Uh, and I'm looking forward yes. to that day when we can uh, be together again. And We will, uh, don't worry. <laughs> we will, don't worry. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, we will, don't Absolutely. worry. I hope you found that as engaging and rousing as I did. I love John's determination that there is work to do and we ought to do it, especially in thinking about how we do that alongside our young people. In next week's episode, we delve once again into the history with women of the Windrush generation. Join us then for another Black Lives Matter at SJDK.